Today's episode of the RiderFlex podcast is sponsored by our friends at Vacation Fund. It's a new employee vacation saving platform. It allows employees to direct a portion of their paycheck into a separate vacation fund account and allows companies to top up those contributions. Vacation Fund is a cost-effective strategy for competitive companies to attract talent, reduce the risk of burnout, and increase employee retention. Go ahead and give us an overview for the listeners. Diamond Ventures today, tell us what they do. Give us a nice a summary, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to. So, so Diamond Ventures was incorporated back in 88 or 89, um, and it was organized to be kind of a management company for a uh, balance sheet of, of real estate investments. And so okay. there were a lot of land holdings, um, lar- you know, thousands of acres. Um, as well as some business holdings in there, operational businesses as well, that kind of just needed a management company or maybe a development company um, that could continue to both manage and grow that portfolio. Um, and so over that time frame, the company has grown, um, developed a really, really great reputation for itself in the market of Southern Arizona for being um, hardworking, uh, tough but fair organization um, that has proven to be successful time over time. And so what we've become today is a um, land development um, real estate investment company that spans everything from residential real estate to commercial real estate um, to uh, ground up development to just horizontal development. And, um, and that really is the core business of Diamond Ventures. Um, like I kind of alluded to, through this whole time, we had been making some investments in operational businesses as well. Okay. Um, some of those included um, the local NBC affiliate, KVOA, Channel 4 in Tucson. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, a mail order magazine, which a lot of people probably don't know what a mail order magazine is now, <laughs> but it was kind of for <laughs> online shopping, um, you know, that was successful. Uh, there was a window and door company. So, you know, real, um, opportunities presented themselves all the way, uh, mm-hmm. along the way to become equity partners in these businesses. Um, it was never a kind of investment strategy or there was no normal cadence to do that. Um, but we had been successful over the years. Um, the, the most successful one of these investments was a, was a company started in Tucson called Coplink, which was a software company that um, took disparate sources of data um, and kind of brought them together and allowed you to do kind of suspect generation for law enforcement. And, uh, and that company was, we brought in a gentleman named Bob Griffin to come in and, and, and be the CEO of that company. Um, and Bob grew that company. It merged with a larger organization called I2 and eventually sold to IBM uh, for a really nice exit. Um, nice, nice. And, you know, we, and so, and so, so um, the reason I tell that story is because so Bob, um, you know, went to work for IBM for several years um, and went to go work in Silicon Valley as a CEO for a couple of years. Um, and in 2018, um, we had been talking with him and we decided, you know, we have this real estate machine that is, that is successful, um, but we want a little bit of diversification in our portfolio outside of just real estate. And we recognize that we have some experience in, in investing in operational companies. Bob became available. I had my degree in technology and we'd been doing some venture. And kind of the stars aligned. And so in 2018, we formed a subsidiary called DVI Equity Partners. And so the goal of DVI Equity Partners is to focus on the um, early stage investment in technology focused companies. Um, and Bob and I are partners in that business. Um, and along with our, our uh, principal, Knock Can, uh, the three of us kind of run that organization and focus more on venture capital uh, and private equity than the real estate arm of Diamond Ventures. I got gotcha. you. And yeah. what, what kind of companies do you invest in? Like what's a typical, you know, profile for you to invest in for DVI? Yeah, you know, to, to date, what we've been focusing on is kind of um, what we call uh, Series A uh, raises for companies. Okay. Um, you know, it's tough to define. That's a moving target of what that really means. So, so, you know, I think that's probably um, a company to me that's got about a million dollars in annual recurring revenue. You've demonstrated some sort of product market fit or some need for the solution or or service that you're providing in the marketplace. Um, The the company is going to have some sort of maybe um, growth opportunity. And this is an overused term, so apologize, but some sort of inflection point in their business. Um, where they're looking for some kind of growth capital to really scale up, um, you know, and, and then there's, there's kind of other things that we dive into, but, but our investment thesis is built around two core, core principles. Okay. Um, the first is we're looking for a business that's part of an emerging trend. 
right? Something maybe, and the, the, the uh, analogy that I use or the metaphor that I use is, is the pie, right? The, the pie. And if you can take a piece of a pie and grow your market share, the piece of your pie gets bigger and that's great. Maybe if you're a clothing company, that's what you try to do. You just try to take more market share of the clothing space. What we're looking for with emerging trends and emerging industries is for a company that can not only take a growing piece of that, that pie, but that the pie itself is going to be growing, right? Wow. And so now you have exponential growth um, beyond just a market share thing. So, so we're looking for emerging trends that are, that are um, really, uh, you know, 10, 20 <laughs> okay. years out. Um, the, second, the second core principle of our investment thesis is what, what's called the Levi Strauss model. And this is talked about, um, you know, sometimes often. It's, it's, if you think back to the gold rush in California in the 1800s, you know, I personally can't name a single gold miner that struck gold. Like, I don't, I don't know any of them by name, right? But, I, but I'm, you know, wearing Levi Strauss jeans, right? What did he do? He made, he made jeans and provided pickaxes and shovels for every gold miner. Didn't matter if they struck gold or not. They all needed what he was providing. And so that kind of Levi Strauss model being the, uh, the mm -hmm. company that provides those pickaxes and shovels for all of the gold miners is kind of what we're looking for as well. So those two, two principles kind of guide our, our investment thesis at DVI Equity Partners. What's your typical investment size or can you talk about that or give us a range? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're looking to typically write about 500000 to a million dollar check in the first round of investment. Um, okay. We have a pretty, pretty large capacity to follow on um, as needed. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, I'd say the largest investment we have in a single entity is about um, 3.75 million. Okay. Um, and the smallest we have right now is 300,000. So there's a range, but that 500 to 1 million is really kind of where we're looking for that initial size. Or and it's, and it sounds like, I mean, you, you touched on it. It sounds like you dance a little between what you would call VC and PE. It sounds like you're, you yeah. talk about, talk, talk about that a little bit. <laughs> yeah. You know, we do, you know, um, there's, um, and you know, the, I use the terms loosely because we probably, right. we aren't, you know, the, the strict definition of private equity where we're going to go in, buy a majority stake in a company, you know, put a bunch of debt on it, build the EBITDA up and flip it. You know, we're, we're, we're really not that company. We're not built for that. But, you know, the term that I used earlier, and there's a specific reason why we put this in our, our name of our company, we, we like to view ourselves as equity partners, right? Okay. Um, and, and, and when I talk about VC, you know, it's kind of our, our traditional sense of venture. We're going to buy a minority stake in a company. We're going to bring a certain level of expertise, maybe a Rolodex of contacts that we can bring to the company to be, you know, a useful investor. But we're going to be a minority stake and we're not going to be day to day um, in that company. And we're going to hope for a large exit. You know, we're not going to make cash along the way. And it's going to be mostly based on um, the ability to, to either sell or um, go public with the company. Um, okay. On the private equity side, what we're looking for is maybe a business that's been in in business for five plus years, and it's a good lifestyle business, let's say. Um, and maybe they've always been flirting with break even, or maybe they are break even. Uh, maybe they even make a little bit of money, but what they need is an injection of cash. You just and described those, you, you, you just described ninety percent of the small businesses in America. <laughs> and that's and that's the, right, and that's the crux of the issue. And I'll talk about that in a second. But but they're, you know they're looking for a little bit of cash. And, and business expertise and the same acumen that we can bring to our venture companies um, to come in and bring, bring it to, to this type of company and, and grow it, right? Because that, in that sense, maybe you make a lot of money on an exit uh, and some kind of multiple there. But the truth is, you can make distributions all along the way as well. And we could be fat cats, you know, w with cash that way. So, so I guess the, the, the reason why we do both is because, and I talk, to, I talk about this with my, with my friends in the investment community, is that there's not a one size fits all. Yeah, right. right. Um, yep. You know, when we talk about venture, venture is what I call sex. Right. I mean, you think about Uber and Facebook and Airbnb and these classic exits. Everybody wants, you know, a, sure. Whatever. Five thousand percent IRR. Like I, I would love that, too. The reality is not every company is built to be venture backed. Um, and, 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 you know, I think that's important to consider um, because most aren't. Most you know, aren't. Yeah. Most, most aren't. are not. That's correct. I mean, yeah. what you need to consider is, you know, um, do I want to give up some, um, you know, autonomy in my decision making? Do I want to have investor reporting as a major part of what I'm doing? Do I want to scale at all costs if that's what my investors want? Um, you know, am I going only for an exit or do I maybe want to build a lifestyle business? You know, th these are the things that kind of we, we, we see in the marketplace and, and, and it's not as simple as, okay, you want money? Go talk to all these venture firms 
um, because the incentives may not be aligned. And so, and so that's why we kind of present ourselves more as equity partners, um, as a kind of, you know, outside of debt, which we don't do at the moment. Um, you know, we'd like to be some kind of solution for you where it's a, where it's a win-win for both sides. You know, it's so interesting. You mentioned the lifestyle uh, business and the decision for the founder or the company owners at some point, right? Because I just had this conversation, RiderFlex, as a recruiting firm, we're, we're, about a, we're about a million dollar revenue firm. And I was visiting with uh, a couple of my advisory board members and they recently had that conversation with me. They basically said, so, okay, good job on getting it where it's at. Now, now what are you, is this a lifestyle brand for you and your partner and your wives and you're just going to, you know, enjoy life and, and pay yourself a decent salary and that's it? Or is it, or are you going to take it to the next level and take on cash? And I remember thinking at dinner, thinking to myself, I don't know. I don't know, actually. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, and, and, yeah. <laughs> and look, that's, that is a, that is something that every business owner and entrepreneur, yep. this, this fork will always, it will always come to a fork in the road. Right. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. You know, and, and so a very influential figure in my life and a lot of people's lives was my grandpa, right? He was a very successful, charismatic businessman. Right. And he told me there's tier one, tier two and tier three. And he's like, you decide what you want to be. Right. Mm. He says tier one, whatever. I mean, you know, maybe it's just you. Maybe you're a, 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 an independent contractor and you make money when you want to make money and you, you got to you live life and it's very comfortable. There's yeah. tier two. Right. Where you'll run, you run a business. You're responsible for other people's livelihoods and their family. Um, and you have more responsibility. But at the end of the day, it's still a lifestyle business. And lifestyle you're not, business. Yeah. I mean, you're not pulling your hair out. And number yeah. three is you're, you're pedal to the metal hundred percent of the time. I mean, it's, it, there's yeah. never sleep, right? I mean, it's, it's, if you want to grow, you got to grow. And there's a certain level of commitment to take it from one to two and two to three. And so none are right. None are wrong. It's just that decision. When you come to that inflection or that, that kind of decision point in your, in your company's maturity, mm -hmm. it's, that's when you make that choice. So yeah. And, you, it's, and, it's and, and tier three means you're taking other people's money. So it's a, it's a whole different yeah. stress level. Like a whole different yeah, stress level. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's a difference between you know having five employees and having twenty employees and having five hundred employees and, and more. It's uh, I you know actually real quick on that. I joke around. Um, you know, a, a lot of the most successful people I've met in my career um, are, are really good at what they do, and their company naturally grows because they're very good at what they right. do. And right. over time, they start to do less of what made them so successful, less of what they're really good at, and more HR management more organizational management and maybe less real estate or less mm -hmm. software mm -hmm. or whatever it was. It's just an interesting dynamic to see kind of how companies grow and how, how they evolve over time. The RiderFlex podcast features entrepreneurs, business executives, and the stories behind how they got there, as well as daily tips on career advice and job interviews. Our show can be heard just about anywhere these days, but you can visit riderflex.com and click on the podcast page to hear all the previous episodes and learn more about the recruiting and consulting services we provide. Contact us at the email address info at riderflex.com or 888-964-5876. Thanks so much for listening. And if you enjoy our show, please be sure to subscribe to our channel and like the episodes.